Stu Gatz here for 1-800-Flowers. If you've been to the mall recently, I'm sure you've noticed that everyone is coming down with holiday fever. The lines are more tangled than a box of Christmas lights, and there's no such thing as a quick trip. Luckily, 1-800-Flowers.com makes finding the perfect gift a joyous occasion. Skipping lines and hitting 1-800-Flowers is my holiday answer, and right now, 1-800-Flowers is giving our listeners a special 24 for 24 offer, 24 holiday light roses for just $24. That's 24 holiday lights roses for just $24. That's only a dollar per rose. 24 Holiday Light Roses are the perfect way to give a holiday surprise to the special someone on your list. This beautiful bouquet of two dozen roses in a rush of Christmas light tones will leave your loved ones stunned without spending a fortune. It's the best of both worlds, holiday roses at an unbeatable price. These gorgeous roses from 1-800-Flowers are picked at their peak and shipped overnight to ensure freshness. 24 Holiday Lights Roses for only $24 is an unreal deal, but... It expires Wednesday. When it comes to meaningful holiday moments, trust in the quality bouquets of 1-800-Flowers.com. To order 24 Holiday Lights Roses for just $24, go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash Dan. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash Dan. Hurry, the offer ends Wednesday, so get yours now. With the City Double Cash Card, you get 1% cash back when you buy and 1% as you pay. That's like the joy of getting two W's on the road or catching the home run ball without spilling your drink. Double boom. Double the love with the City Double Cash Card. Apply now at city.com slash double cash. We'll get to Mike Ryan's weird texts with his father in a second. Oh, yeah. I felt bad for Mike this week and um, going up to Charlotte and then having the game play out that way. I didn't articulate it very well as someone who works with words for a living, but basically what I was trying to articulate all of last week on what I thought the Hurricanes were and what they needed to happen Right. I was trying to avoid something that looked like that this season. At any point this season, I was I wanted to avoid, figure out a way to avoid them getting exposed in a way where you're like, oh my God, that team is so much bigger, stronger, and faster. They're injuring our players. They're right. they're inj- the players we have left, they're injuring them. Right. Yeah. I thought, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it felt like last week you were saying this was the best possible outcome for the University of Miami. No, but I wanted a closer game. I wanted a closer game to avoid something like this. Yeah, the way that you explained it was win that game, but it's it's better to lose that game so that doesn't happen in the Final Four and said that happened in the game before the Final Four. I would have rather had the ACC championship, to be quite honest with you. I just didn't want the fan base to feel what it felt in that game, which is... Oh no, we're not that close. They're they're three deep at that position. They do <laughs> they got a better Berrios than we do. Yeah, Renfro. they've got a better Rosier than we do. A lot better. <laughs> they've got a better yes. defensive line than we do. Yeah, yeah. Don't feel bad for me, man. Uh, that I went to that game and yeah, it sucked at halftime, and I left early, and um, it was a hell of a lot of work to get to that game and the reward wasn't great but leading up to it that was such a celebration of a wonderful season and they met their goal they made it to the game you left at halftime i left uh midway through the third quarter after it looked like i gave them after that because i had a i had to wake up at 2 15 a.m that makes sense there were a handful of things that were interesting about that game um you saw what it looks like when miami doesn't have the speed advantage you saw what it looked like. Basically, Clemson made Miami look the way Miami made Notre Dame look. And the thing that I was most wrong about this season, Stu Gatz, wasn't about Miami. It was about Notre Dame. I made that Notre Dame team something that it wasn't, and so I made the victory against Notre Dame mean something that it didn't. Right, but you're you're not alone. Uh, you weren't alone in that way of thinking. I mean, Notre Dame had earned that headed into that game. They had played really well headed into that game. And so it felt, you know, you had two teams who were – you know, one with the one loss and one who was undefeated and two of them in the top five or six, and it felt like a big game. It was a big game at I, the time. I, I was sitting there pretty much on the field. I didn't see a speed advantage. What I saw was just overwhelming uh, amounts of players that can that, that are just crazy skill talent. Anytime Etienne tried to go to the outside, a defensive lineman, Chad Thomas, who was hobbled the entire game, was there to meet him, and our receivers were beating their secondary guys consistently down the field. We just didn't have enough. Mike, the Miami offense looked slow against the Clemson defense. That Rozier missed a couple of passes and that there were a couple of people open in the secondary, like the Miami offense, there is no disputing it. The reason the Miami offense had no chance in that game is because when you were watching that game on television, the, the team 
the, the team that was getting all the stops looked a great deal faster than Miami's offense because Miami's skilled, fast guys weren't on the field. Miami, right, yeah. Miami's trying to outwill you to death with Barrios. Yeah, they were um, usually on the outside. You have Jeff Thomas and Amon Richards. Those are two four three guys and you have Barrios doing his damage on the inside and then you could throw out uh, a swing pass to Herndon who's a freak he looks like a freak and he doesn't look the same way Michael Irvin the second does <laughs> uh that one that one's interesting I was surprised uh I've been surprised to see that Michael Irvin's kid uh doesn't seem to be in great cardiovascular shape we we just don't have enough yet we're not deep enough. We couldn't survive. Do you feel like you'll have enough all maybe injuries. starting next year? I honestly don't think we're that – it's hard to – Did you hear what Rick said, Stugatz? Did you no, hear what I Rick, did not. Rick no, said no. we've got players who can compete with anyone in America. We just don't have enough of them. Right. But I wonder if that's Clemson. Be... Clemson has enough of them. Right, but I wonder how long – so this will be his third recruiting class coming up? This yeah. offseason, yeah. I wonder how long it takes for him to get enough good players. Right, right you know? now, right now, you're looking at a top three recruiting class by uh, the people that do this for a living. Uh, I know this sounds ridiculous, considering we didn't look like we belonged on the same field with Clemson. We're not that far away. We're we're really not. Well, but you're quarterback away. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. Here's my bold prediction. Feels like they're very far away. That's like, far away, like seven Mike. Touchdowns that, that's, away. that's far away. Yeah. Clemson, Clemson's showing you, yeah, we can win the title with a, a, a pro at quarterback, and we can win a title with his replacement at quarterback. Miami. I, I sort of have a bold prediction in regards to that position next year. I think after this bowl game here, this Orange Bowl, uh, no matter what performance you get from Rozier. I'm of the personal belief Rozier's started his last game. Oh, I believe that too. You think that's a bold prediction? I think that's obvious. Well, most I, most people think that you ride with a quarterback that took you to a New Year's Bowl, right? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. They've I been think trying Perry, to hide him all year. They've been trying to hide him all year, waiting for the kid to get ready. Like, yeah, no. I, I think uh, I think Perry is probably your starter next year. On defense... Isn't that a foregone conclusion, though, Mike? I no. thought I thought people sort of understood that this is not going to go to Rozier next year. Uh, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. I think we're surprising a lot of people right now because there aren't, aren't a lot of people. I mean, if you're a Canes fan, a diehard Canes fan, you know the name in Kosey Perry. But why would most people no, know but the Mike, name but Mike, of a red if, shirt? If, if Rozier is your starting quarterback next year, uh, Mark Richt will have conceded that he was wrong about what he thought. From a young prospect, yeah, he, that means that they miss on Perry. If that, Perry, yes, like the I thought Perry was going to start this year. I, in fact, in fact, if you go back to the original arguments we were having about this team, Mike, I, what I was saying from the very beginning, before games even started and wins started happening, was if Perry doesn't win that job, you don't win the title because Rozier's not good enough. That's not a that's you need you need your quarterback to be better than that unless you're Alabama and you've got so much pro talent and now I guess Clemson so much pro talent all over the place that um that it doesn't matter who your quarterback is. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Rozier would be fine in Alabama. Rozier so. Rozier would be fine running around back there in Alabama. I yeah. feel like they've won with worse quarterbacks. Our our injuries you know? got, our injuries got to got to the point where you needed Rozier to elevate and carry a team and and he's not that kind of talent. He's been Credit to him because he's come a very long way, but he he's not that kind of transcendent talent to escape losing your running back one, tight end one, and wide receiver one. On defense, we had so many injuries uh, this game. At the very beginning, that bandy injury on the first play, he's in a walking boot. Now that completely changes. Yeah, they go to zone after you that. go to zone, and I didn't notice this while I was at the game. Mike Jackson was in and out of that game the entire time. He got banged up too. We went to zone at a necessity because Mike, we just I, didn't. I, have those I guys don't know if up. anyone else experienced it this way. I did. I ended up feeling bad for Miami during that game, not because Dugats of the beating they were taking on the scoreboard, because of the number of timeouts that were required for injured Miami players. It was not Clemson players who were getting injured. Right. It was Miami player after Miami player, at least in part because you had something very close to the pros on one sideline and you've got the second and third teamers that are required to be in for the Miami Hurricanes because they're already so injured and they're young. They're not physically as large as the people who are hitting them. Part of what made me sad leaving that game was just, oh, man, not not like this. I know we're not this team, and everyone's going to point and say that they were that all season, and 
it's just not a fair fight. I know we're not as good as Clemson right now. I know we're still building, but we're not 38-3 to bad. They're, we're not that far away. What made me sad was um, realizing Miami now has to play Wisconsin. That's a bummer. Oh, I don't want to watch that game. Oh, I'm talking about Oh, this is great. Slow, big, white offensive lineman. Doesn't matter. Boys, boys we're back. We're back. Uh, everyone's going to go. We're gonna, they're going to feel back again. Everyone's going to feel back again. <laughs> oh, this, we are made to take on the huge, slow, white offensive line. I don't want Give it to me at the rock. Yeah, you want something that ends the season that feels different than this does. <laughs> I want it so badly, Miami against UCF. Yeah, but I think you got, for UCF, for you, and congratulations to them, they won a national championship, but for you, uh, I think you got a good measuring stick here. Well, I do, you got well, Auburn, man. Well, Auburn beat yes, Alabama yeah, and Georgia, yes, and now you see Auburn, UCF Auburn, can beat yes, them. Auburn can beat anybody, and if right. UCF beats Auburn, I'm headed to UCF to declare them national champions right. in my personal record book. Oh, but you got the built-in excuse already. Frost has already got one foot in. He's coaching that bowl game, though, yeah. still. I yeah, but know. you'll be able to say that UCF went undefeated and beat the team that beat Alabama and Georgia, which might be one of the national, you know, might be the national championship team. I mean, you are looking good here, Levitz. <laughs> now, wait, uh, Mike and I were talking about going and have a ceremony at UCF, like changing the imaging of the station, your home for night's football. <laughs> and I go up there, and we invite Scott Frost back from Nebraska to come and accept his <laughs> national championship trophy given by nobody but me. It's just a repurposed Lobo Bowl trophy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it, Please make this happen. It is. For those who don't know, what is this, the third year of that fantasy league? Mike, because yeah. he... Uh, He's a fantasy uh, elitist and weirdo. Uh, bought a trophy bigger than Shaq for the winner of that. Uh, it, it took up our entire uh, third quarter budget uh, <laughs> for marketing a seven foot trophy. Yeah, well, go ahead. Tell me why you're shaking your head back there because of Mike's terrible judgment and Mike's uh, Mike's incredible self involvement. Why were you shaking your head back there? It's so stupid, that trophy. It came in a refrigerator box. We couldn't get it upstairs. No one wants it. No one wants to win this league because they don't want the trophy. Well, that's what's great. What's great. This is one of the things that's great about it, Stugatz, is Mike won the trophy, was so happy to have it, spent too much of the budget on the trophy, totally irresponsible and probably fireable offense in terms of judgment, spent way too much money on the trophy, wins it, keeps it in his garage. Then the next year, auto drafting, never paying attention to the team, never making a substitution, never knowing who's on my team. Right. I beat everybody, and I refused the trophy. And now Mike <laughs> Mike was fine with the trophy in his house when he won it, but sure. now that I don't want it and it's my trophy, Mike wants it out of his house. <laughs> well, what if you win this year, though, Mike? Mrs. Mike wants it out of the house, too. <laughs> There's a giant trophy. Where is it? In your garage? Like, where I'll is it? I'll send you a picture of it today. It's, it's, it takes up. I have a one-car garage. It takes up the car <laughs> portion of the garage. <laughs> it's, it's an eyesore. And I would like to give it to Dan, even if he would take it. I can't transport it in my Toyota Camry. It's way too large. I it, need to get. I need to rent a truck to drop this thing off. Um. I cannot wait to start talking about this Gronk thing. Gronk fights exactly as I imagine Gronk would fight, which is stupidly. Yep. Like, he's not using his fist. He's not waiting till you get up. He's. I mean, what he did was moronic. Just it, it was pretty dangerous. bad, man. It's, yeah, dangerous. It's dangerous. Yes, it was cheap is what it was. He caused a concussion. Yes, yes. He caused a brain injury, that guy. It was bad, man. He's massive. He's the schoolyard bully that has no idea that his own strength. It was odd to see Gronk because it's always Gronk being Gronk, and it was odd to see him yes. receive a ton of well, criticism see, from no, everyone. No, but this is what happened. You see, I've warned you about this for years on this I Told You So Monday. When you train a polar bear to play tight end, that's what happens when the tranquilizers wear off during play. <laughs> I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I've never felt more alive. Disclaimer, Geico cannot guarantee you will feel more alive. You either possess functioning respiratory and circulatory systems, or you do not, or you are a zombie. If you are indeed a brain-starved zombie and you would like to save money on car insurance, the Geico legal team applauds your excellent life choices, even in your shambling afterlife. But we strongly encourage you to visit Geico.com or download the Geico app. Please stay a minimum of 500 feet away from our large and presumably delicious, delicious brains. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Don Levitard. Hey, gravy vampire. <laughs> I'll stop laughing at these. I'm sorry. 
Gravy vampire is good, right? <laughs> Stugats. I don't even know what it means exactly. Like, what am I doing? Am I just showing up while you're eating gravy and I wait for you to consume it and then I attack your neck so yeah. I can get the gravy as it goes down? You <laughs> suck the gravy out of people. Right. I, okay, but I wait. I, I just hang out at like Golden Corral waiting for people to put extra gravy. Like, how does this extraordinarily niche vampire work? This is the Dan Levatar show with the Stugats on the ticket. You hate when what happens to the University of Miami is sort of the same thing that happened to the Miami Heat last night, where you got to look at an uncomfortable truth in the face and you don't ever want to see it that clearly. <laughs> Ooh, we're not close. You, you, don't, you never, you never want to see. You, you ever want to? You always want to hope and convince yourself and believe, and then you get like they, the Golden State and Clemson. They stick your face in the mirror, and you're like, "No, I'm hideous." <laughs> Still got uh, spent yesterday, Mike. I <laughs> these Jets fans and Dolphin fans have been in this, I hate it, man. In, in this purgatory I hate for, it. for twenty damn years. To God's where um, they they both win yesterday, and you don't really want them to. Uh, you don't really want them to. They win games. You don't want them to win. But then they get the win and they beat the Chiefs. So what do I start doing yesterday at around four thirty? Start looking at playoff scenarios. And I'm wondering if nine and seven can get me in, and it can. <laughs> but it's going to take a lot of help. No, but I hate this so much, so much. I hate this whole thing where the Dolphins and the Jets are playing these just completely meaningless games yesterday. I hate the lament of the Dolphin and Jets fans upset that they won. It's so weird to well, me. Well, I mean, you're the wrong we person. We can't even lose, right. right? So you'll be miserable yeah. if you lose. You'll be miserable if you win. I don't get it. If you draft well, it doesn't matter if you're at the top. Lord knows it doesn't guarantee success. For those of you who don't know, Mike Ryan is a Cleveland Browns fan because when he was a young boy, his grandmother, uh, Abuelita, took him to the dollar store and bought dishes, Cleveland Brown dishes, discounted his team even back then. Now, Mike, give uh, give Dan the stat, uh, the number of wins. That whatever stat you gave me right before the show about the Browns and the number of wins they have since a certain day. Please share the last uh, the last twenty eight times I've sat down on a couch to watch my uh, my football team win a competition. I have gotten off that couch disappointed twenty seven times. <laughs> that means twenty eight games, one beacon of happiness, <laughs> one. The last quarterback to win a game on a football Sunday. Everyone gets excited. Sundays, you know, red zone, fantasy, your team winning occasionally. Johnny Manziel was the last quarterback to win a game on a Sunday for the Cleveland Browns. Since Thanksgiving of 2014, my Cleveland Browns have gone 4 and 45. <laughs> I am 40 games under 500 uh, yeah. since 2014. Yeah. This is an ancient history. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was yesterday. I uh, I feel like Stugatz and I are these two guys sitting at a bar, and Stugatz is missing a finger, and I've got a foot in a cast, and we're complaining <laughs> about our lot in life. And then brought in on a stretcher and with a body cast is Mike Ryan for a drink propped up at the table next to us. To give us perspective on what football life is for the truly, <laughs> truly miserable. Like, you think you've got a bad uh, He's hooked up to machines. His nurse has to help him up to get the drink as we're complaining about our pain. Uh, Stu Gatz, you know, sees guys like Danny Woodhead leave the Jets and have success with the New England Patriots and become really important parts to championship teams. I'm doing that with Josh McCown now. I just see Josh McCown. Yeah. And you're falling for the trick, aren't you? If we got this guy just five years earlier, <laughs> woo! That is I've the uh, fell for it, yeah, a couple of times this year. Yes, he's a good man. But then there are times where he's the worst quarterback I've ever seen. Well, yeah, it's yeah. usually when he decides to run. <laughs> um, what uh, what have I been wrong about recently? Because this was a big weekend for me. Nothing. You've been right about everything. <laughs> but, I mean, oh, Alex man. Smith, Matt, Matt Stafford. <laughs> yeah. Well, Alex Smith is not the problem. <laughs> well, but I mean, just the Chiefs in general. When they were 5-0, and you were telling me they were a different This is team. different. They got Tyree Kill. They got Kareem Hunt. This is a different Chiefs team. God, it's the same old Chiefs team. <laughs> and they were even throwing the ball deep yesterday, and they still lost. Yeah. That was yeah. weird. Marcus yeah. Peters is throwing flags into the How stands. How great was that? And coming back with his socks off. Wait a minute. <laughs> 
which was weird. <laughs> That's how rage works. Remember that conversation we were having last week about rage and not considering consequences? Marcus Peters reached rage. And when it, when that happens with the 300-pounders, it looks like what Gronk does. You know what I mean? Or what Indomit and Sue does. But Marcus Peters isn't going to beat anybody up, so he takes the ref's flag and hurls it. Did it actually make the crowd? Or It made the crowd. The uh, the kid who caught it has turned into somewhat of a celebrity <laughs> here. He's taking selfies with <laughs> with the great. flag. It's fantastic. It's yeah. All right, so help me understand. I mean, Stugatz of the day. He did it right, man. I'm proud of him. All right, help me understand because, Stugatz, the way that I like to watch, this is going to be funny to you. The way I like to watch football on Sunday is trailing it by a half hour. Like yep. on the TiVo, I've just got to pause so that I'm not missing anything and I can just go back and forth as I please. Good way of doing it. Yep. So I'm a half hour behind. I don't start or start watching football until late later. And what I'm wondering is I had lost interest by the end of the 1 o'clock games, and so this I'm just fast-forwarding through Chiefs and Jets. Mm-hmm. This is going to be funny to you. So I have not seen how that game ended entirely. I just was fast-forwarding through very confusing. It seemed like the Jets were at the goal line for the entire fourth quarter. Uh, they, I think they had a nine-play a nine stretch because of penalties and stuff. They needed to get a yard, and they couldn't get that yard. I believe it was a nine-play so stretch. So I was seeing that right. <laughs> I was sitting there fast-forwarding through the whole tail end of the fourth quarter, and I'm like... How are the Jets still inside the five yard line? Like I'm look, I'm fiddling with the TiVo. I'm like, is there something wrong with the TiVo? Like, nope. The, is there a glitch? How? How? So the the Jets ran nine plays inside of the five yard line, and I believe they came away with a field goal. Yeah, I'm checking on it right now to get the exact order of plays. And in the middle of that, Peters was frustrated because they kept stopping him and kept getting called for penalties, and the Jets kept getting three more down. That Peters, by the way. Once, no part of contact. None. Not interested in tackling. He seems to be a bit of a uh, a crazy person, too. <laughs> I know that seems fairly obvious, considering he threw a penalty right, flag out of his hand, flag, I, went I, into the locker room, came back wearing his full uniform just without socks. Uh, Stugat, they got to give they got to give Gronk a bigger penalty than they give Peters. Oh, absolutely. Like, Gronk. you have to, those penalties can't be the same. No, Gronk's... One one looks bad and embarrasses your referee. You can't have that kind of questioning of authority, but you cannot have the penalty for Peters being stiffer than the penalty for Gronk this weekend. Uh, no, I think Gronk's got to get, well, he should be suspended this week, right? Yes. At least, right? Yes. For but at least one game. But he'll probably appeal that, or maybe he lets it go because the Patriots play the Dolphins this weekend. I believe Pittsburgh's on the horizon. So maybe he just says, hey, you know what? I did it. It was bad. I'll take my game. We're playing the Dolphins. Sure? I, 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 he might get more than one game. Maybe. Chris Nowin- uh, Chris Nowinski, the uh, the guy from Harvard, the former professional re- uh, wrestler that does a lot um, with concussion studies, retweeted the video of Gronk, and he has this big national platform, and people pay attention to what he says. Gronk's uh, cheap shot gave Tredav- uh, Tredavious White a concussion. If he's not suspended, it signals cheap shots are fair game in the NFL. Had it been Tom Brady's knee, a player would have been banned for life. Just because uh, you can't see the brain getting injured doesn't mean it's not as serious. I think I think Gronk might get hit with something really stiff, like to get your attention stiff. Because they overpenalize on everything. Why wouldn't they overpenalize on something like that? Everything they overpenalize on. From $10,000 fines for your socks being worn wrong. If you've got a concussion crisis in that league, what's too much, Dugats? What's the penalty that if they gave him, I guess, if they gave him the rest of the season, everybody would be like, whoa, no, no, that's too much? Um, Probably uh, too much. Like where it's right on the line, you're saying? Maybe like three games? A three-game suspension? I'm sa- this is what I'm saying. They tried to give Tlaib and Crabtree because of how it looked. They because tried to give him two games. It wasn't because each, right? of damage done. It's right. because the video was all over the place. Of The NFL has players inflicting violence on each other. They tried to give both those guys two games. The union uh, pled it down to one game. So I wonder if this is going to be like four games, and then the union is going to have to plead it down. Like, And I understand what, I, what I'm saying sounds ridiculous, but I think... They love to overpenalize. And you can't have something like that where a guy is woozy and checking his mouth for blood and you t- they take his helmet off, you see his face, you see he's not right, like all that stuff. The consequences of how something look, it's the difference between, I know Gronk didn't intend for that. Gronk was not intending right. to give that guy a concussion. Mm-hmm. But the difference between manslaughter and murder are still consequences and consequences that are serious. Uh, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think. I think it should be three games. 
I do. I think three games seems seems fair for something like that. It was just such a cheap, dirty shot. Was, By the way, the Chiefs got uh, the Jets got the ball, Dan, in that game. They got the ball first and goal from the five. It took them eleven plays. Now there were penalties and stuff, but eleven plays were run before they scored a touchdown. It was a touchdown that they scored. Josh McCown dove into the end zone. Guts, what I'm telling you is what Gronk just did is what Albert Hainsworth did when a helmet came off and he stomped on a dude's face with his cleats. It's what Indomitian Sue right. would do on Thanksgiving that got him a reputation as a dirty player. What Gronk just did was the equivalent. And I, I'm i going to be curious to see if the violence inflicted by a polar bear is treated the same as the violence inflicted by guys who aren't that polar bear. Because... That is that that is as dirty as that sport gets right there. What Gronk did there there you remember do you remember Hainsworth where he couldn't explain in the locker room why he did what he did and everybody was like, What kind of animal? That's how we were introduced to Hainsworth. Nobody knew who the hell the defensive tackle for the Tennessee Titans was. Um, according to ESPN.com, and I apologize if someone said this, he got five games for that. Five games. But then I'm saying this is the same kind of thing. It's just Gronk used his whole body instead of just his foot. And the optics on it were so It's bad. just awful. Yeah. The, yeah. Op- the consequences, that went as bad. The only way it could have gone worse for Gronk is if the dude had passed out. And they had to do prayer circle and and all that stuff. Like, but uh, yeah. So Hainsworth got five games, if you're saying. what? No, and I think Sue probably got two or three. It's in, that, it's in the realm of serious bleep that you cannot have in your sport. Uh, and I just, it's so Patriots, Dugats. His rage was because he got pushed off on, really, Gronk? Gronk. He got pushed off on, and the Bills guy got an interception on what Gronk, Gronk, you're going to accuse anybody of pushing off? Right. Like, seriously? <laughs> so Gronk doesn't get his way, gets knocked on his back, and the one time he doesn't get his way, what does he do? He throws an unbelievable temper tantrum with one of the dirtiest plays you've ever seen. Don Lebatard. <laughs> You okay, John? Yeah, that's a good question. I yeah. was going to ask yeah. that. Is everything okay? <coughs> oh, cough. No, I have allergies, so it makes me cough. Okay, no problem. Stugats. You okay? Yeah, are you okay? Yeah, you okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. How about you? I'm fine. Thanks for your concern. You got never met, thanks for yours. I've never had anyone I've never met this concerned over me and my health, so I appreciate it. Okay, man, I'm a big fan, man. I'm concerned about you. <laughs> funny, John. No, I'm not okay. <laughs> Finally, man. You don't care how I'm doing anyway. What the hell are you talking it's asking true. me for? It's you don't true. really You're, care. It's so true. You don't even know me. <laughs> This is the Dan Lebatar Show with the Stugats on the ticket. Stugats, if you are a fan of South Florida sports, which of these right now makes you the most furious? I'm going to give you a handful of things here. What Clemson did to the University of Miami football team. Right. That Rick Spielman is winning in Minnesota. The guy who a long time ago was your player personnel guy has put together something in Minnesota that all of a sudden you're looking at it and you're reminded, just like you are when you see Ted Ginn doing anything for the Saints, you're just reminded of how incompetent your people have been and that this place swallows everybody or Mm -hmm. the Mike Stanton, the Giancarlo Stanton stuff where they are strong-arming him. They come in here, they pay $1.1 billion. Right. And they are strong-arming him into San Francisco or St. Louis. They're leaking stuff, putting pressure on him to accept deals that have been in place, even though he says that's not where he wants to go. Sure. He says he wants to go to New York or Los Angeles. He's got a no-trade clause. Bleep them. They've got a trade in place for San Francisco and the Cardinals if he doesn't want to go. Bleep yourself. Right. So to answer your question, he controls that situation and not enough people care about the Marlins for that to be All the of it. one. Well, yes. but no, I'd go the other way on that, though, Stu Gatz. Not only is it that not enough people care about the Marlins, I'd go the other way. They only should care enough to block this thing and tell, no, no, not the MVP of the league. Right. No, he doesn't want to go. We don't want him to go. Call their bluff. Make them keep going months and months into their new regime. Put pressure on them to go months and months into their new regime where they have to go and field a team where he's the only one on it. What makes that tricky is Stanton loves his teammates, and maybe there's a part of him saying, hey, 
if I don't accept one of these, all these guys are going to be gone. Not and his if, problem. And if I block it, then I'm not going to be not, playing with not, any of these not guys. Not his problem right, and stuff. unfair, the way that they're totally putting unfair. that pressure yes. on him. Totally unfair. You, uh, I would say it's Rick Spielman because the Canes seem to be on the right, you know, the right path. But people love the Dolphins down here still. Um, and I would say it's Rick Spielman putting together that kind of roster. Um, that's got to be frustrating. For I mean, Dolphin Rick fans. Spielman, the general manager of the Vikings, has known for a couple of years. He's been trying to replace. He's been he had Bridgewater and he traded for Brad uh, Bradford. Bradford, w- right? When all of us were like, "What are you doing? You're not a piece away. Why are you trading for Bradford?" Correct. And now he has Case Keenum. The defense is phenomenal. Dalvin Cook is hurt, and he was great to start the season. And their, their receivers are as good as any. Guillermo, what were you going to say about the Stanton situation? Well, I mean, he can love his teammates, but he's going to love them enough, enough to live in St. Louis for eight years, ten years, or San Francisco for ten years on teams he doesn't want to be a part of. Like right. Ser- At some point, you have to worry about yourself. Seriously, I don't think the fan base would blame him. if He got, man, look. He got that no-trade clause, and we all understood why he got it. We were stunned that the Marlins gave it to him. He did not trust management. And here is yet more management, different management, coming in here and trying to move him around to places he doesn't want to go. If you ask the fan base, choose one, Stanton or the rest of the team. They choose Stanton, right? I don't know. Ask Guillermo. He's the, he's the <laughs> diehard we have around here. What do you want Stanton to do, Guillermo? You wouldn't. I know you. I know you are down on Jeter and the new regime. But what do you want Stanton to do? I mean, I want him to stay. But at this point, does it make a difference? Like he's going to be gone if he agrees to the thing. And if not, they're going to trade everyone else. So either way, I either have Stanton and a bad team, or I have a team that's okay, and then they'll slowly tear them apart, but too. But, Guillermo, the way they're framing this is we've got they are putting public pressure on Stanton because they've got deals in place with San Francisco and St. Louis. They are framing all of this in a way that is making Stanton choose between is Ozuna going to be able to stay there? Is Yelich going to be able to stay there? What they're doing is gross. It's disgusting. Yeah, what they're doing to him, they're tra- he's got a no-trade clause, and he told them where he wants to go, and they've ignored him, and they've gone to other teams to try and get trades done. Well, maybe they're just, I mean, you're right. It's gross. It's not the way they should be handling this, especially as new owners, but maybe they're just trying to set a market. They, I mean, no, Stanton they, has said, listen, I'm waiting for no, the Dodgers' no, offer. No, like, but I'm waiting. Stugatz, but they're, yes, they're trying to set a market, but also they're trying to do what's best for the team. They are doing their job by trying to get the best set of prospects, but what I'm saying is this is a cold way to do business no with a guy who just won an MVP and has got a no-trade clause. That's nice that you want to do what's best for your team. It also doesn't matter because he can nuke everything you're doing contractually. He's got the right. But I don't think they're going to – they may be trying to make him look like the bad guy, but I don't think it's working. I think they've turned on the organization already. Like, he was at the Heat game yesterday, Derek Jeter, and they booed him. They booed Derek Jeter at the Heat game yesterday. He's on the team for two months. Part of this is on baseball, honestly. Why did they agree to this sale knowing what they were going to do? part of it. Not part of it, Guillermo. Uh, most of it. All of it. Most of it is on baseball. And they baseball. approved it because his name is Derek most, Jeter. Most I mean. of it is on baseball. <laughs> and that's why they approved it, if you're asking. <laughs> his name. That's. I, I hate him so much. I hate them. <laughs> I hate him, Dan. I was trying to not say that I hated them, but I hate them. That's all right. Let it out. I don't know man. what else I can do. Yep. I, it's, it, I understand where you're coming from, turning your, your vitriol towards Derek Jeter. Guy got a baseball team for free. He's doing what almost anybody in his position would do. It's on Major League Baseball. They owed it to this market to not have a Loria do over with the next owner, and they didn't care. Well, this is this is offensive, though. The part one of the things that's also offensive, and I I just hope the reporters in this market start looking into this. The idea that listen to what I'm saying here because this is what it looks like. I don't know this to be so. Okay. That Mike, in fact, put the reckless se- speculation sounder out there because reporters in this market need to get on this story. Time to throw away all journalistic credibility and get reckless. Here is something we like to call reckless speculation. Derek Jeter comes in here. Wait a second. You're good. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm very eager to do this, as all you right. can imagine. All right. Derek Jeter comes in here and doesn't care about PR, is letting people go right and left. Last week, we got that report. Marlins let go of Scout, who needs a kidney, who was in the hospital being told by somebody else while recovering from colon cancer. Mm-hmm. Was told he'd been let go by the Marlins. As cold as you can get. And before that, it was Jack McKeon and Andre Dawson and Tony Perez and Jeff Conine. Rich luminaries. Waltz. And Rich Waltz. Yeah. yeah, luminaries. And Rich Waltz. Another luminary. 
you really stepped on the joke there, Guillermo. He like, did, he, yeah. he, but you knew he was going to go to luminaries there when I. I just I can't I can't look at this with a level head. <laughs> All right, no, but hold on, to, but hold on. To be fair hold here. on, hold on. On trying to be fair, the general manager of the team, Samson, is let go. The president is let go. Everybody's let go, except for one guy, the black guy, who's the highest ranking executive black executive in baseball. Well, now Jeter is technically and, and, right, and it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. Did baseball force that as part of the sale? If they were controlling everything else on Jeter, if baseball was controlling everything else, it doesn't make sense that they would keep the same guy who has a barren farm system. Right. It doesn't make sense that you get rid of all the ambassadors who are just symbols, but you keep the guy who's actually at the center of being responsible for you not having any talent. So baseball forced them to keep Mike Hill? I, that's it's the a, reckless speculation of mine. Reckless. As I'm, what I'm telling you is that it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. Do God's look at it. They're not keeping the executives. They're trying to clean house. There had to be conditions on how it is that the Marlins ended up in Jeter's hands. There had to be conditions. And because Jeter doesn't know what he was doing, he's probably getting guidance from baseball. And so when Guillermo says part of this is on baseball, no, man. I look at it and say, baseball's been using Miami as a prostitute for a really long time with Lorias and carpetbaggers and... They've been sucking the money out of Miami, and they finally get their ballpark. They get their arena, and then they come back here. They're, they're parasites, man. Like, they they forced Jeter on this market. They didn't take a Cuban guy who was local who said he was going to spend. And they forced Jeter on this market when nobody here wanted Jeter. Nobody here was clamoring for Jeter. And the first thing Jeter does is he goes and is cheaper than the most unpopular owner in the history of South Florida sports. Right. He's almost made you wish that that owner was back. And they knew almost. he was going to do that. They serious. knew he was going to do that. They knew it because he <laughs> revealed that. They knew that this is what was the plan was. If and the, they approved it anyways. If Marlon fans could have Laurie and Samson back right now today, would they take it? Yeah, I, probably. I would. <laughs> I think we should just take Samson back right now and do a movie segment with him. Call yeah. Samson right now. Let's do it today. Yeah. Mike, call him right now. I'm dead serious. No one's clamoring for that. I'm clamoring for it. Call David Sampson. We're going to redo this. Uh, we're going to do the movie segment with David Sampson. <laughs> By the way, I have a bunch of people telling me that we shouldn't blame Michael Hill for some of the bad deals because Loria pushed them through, and it was the other GM because he's the pre- he's the president of baseball operations. Okay, like he's if he's out there introducing these people, telling you what a great deal it is, like there has to be accountability, like. He may not have been the one pushing for them, but he was the guy doing it. Like, he needs to be blamed for this. I understand that the picking of players can largely be subjective, that Rick Spielman could be a terrible general manager in Miami, and all of a sudden he's a great general manager in Minnesota. I understand that all of this is an imprecise science. What I'm telling you is that it doesn't smell right. It doesn't make sense that Jeter would take the unpopular hits and then on the most obvious guy in the entire organization to fire, he keeps him. What sense does that make? He's firing Rich Waltz and Jeff Conine and Andre Dawson and Jack McKeon. What sense does it make? He's firing David Sampson above Mike Hill. He's firing Rich Waltz, popular. He's firing a scout who's got colon cancer, needs a kidney. Why is he keeping the guy and having him make the trade for Stanton? I mean, what sense does that make? Somebody, somebody help me out. Somebody help me understand. Well, I haven't started to investigate it yet, but I will uh, heed your advice and start right after the show. Can, can, what's the argument that you would make, though? Can someone make the argument it, it, for what I'm missing other than baseball force this on everybody? I can give you a very plausible explanation. I'm Mike Hill, understanding that he didn't do a great job with this organization, he knows all the ins and outs of it, and you need somebody on the inside that was there from a previous administration. Transitional I, guy. I, as an employee that's been a part of several other corporate takeovers and whatnot, there's always someone there to sort of transition and build a bridge, and you need someone who's familiar with stuff. Mike, but the one to do that would have been Samson. He's the one who built that ballpark. He's the every seat in that but, ballpark. But, but, the logistics of running that team, that was Samson. Those yeah, but he's attached to the old owner, though. Yeah, yeah. That's tough. And he also, he's not 
he doesn't know about the farm system and he doesn't know about player evaluation. My guess is that uh, St- uh, Jeter's business partners see the business side of things. They've already busted open the books and they realize we got a handle on this. We don't need Samson. And he was attached to Loria anyway. Samson had very bad press. You understand that when Jeter comes to town, Samson has to go. I understand you like David Samson, but many Marlins fans. Oh no, don't. but I'm no, no, no. But I yes, I do like David Samson, and yet I understood totally. Of course, David Samson has to go. The only argument that would have been made on behalf of Samson is the transitional one. But if Samson has to go, so does Hill. Uh, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but you're asking if there's an explanation out there. And if Derek Jeter were to come around and give me that as an explanation, I'd, it, I'd believe him. Okay, I wouldn't say okay. something. I mean, all right, no, work. that's that too was plausible and less sinister than less sinister than mine. Um, that too, I suppose, is plausible. Uh, but if there's anything I would think, if Derek Jeter's totally okay doing all these things in public relations that he's been totally incompetent at, I would think that the one place where Derek Jeter would be like, I got this, is player evaluation. I would think that that's the place where Derek Jeter would say, "Hey, I don't need I just get me somebody here who can run a scouting department. I'll handle trades." Well, wouldn't I you think, think wouldn't I, you think? I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe his ego would say, "Yeah, I can handle the trades," but what what proof do we have that Derek Jeter can I know, actually but handle Scott, that stuff? But his his ego, he's firing people. He's making all these decisions on who should well, be fired. Well, the sad thing is he's not firing them. He's asking someone else to fire them for him. I would say that Jeter is probably handling the baseball operation. So he wouldn't need to talk to Samson because his business guys would be handling that anyway, so he doesn't need to interface with them. He needs to learn this side of the business from someone that's already there and knows the organization. Mike Hill would probably be that guy if I were to argue that there's nothing sinister here at play. If he's running baseball operations, he doesn't need Michael Hill for anything. Like, we need to get advice on the bad players that you got in trades in the bad farm system. Like, I don't understand what Michael I'm not doing advocating here. for the firing of the general manager of the Marlins. I'm confused by why it is Derek Jeter would get a clean start everywhere else. But there, he, there are a million different places where he needs help transitioning. That's the weirdest place for me. Like, there are a million different places. Getting to an office and sitting in a chair with your name on it, like, he's got a million transitions in front of him. The least complicated, to me, would be that one. Yeah, but what does he know about brokering a trade, especially one of the magnitude of a Giancarlo Santon trade? Right, right. but what does he know about anything that he's doing right now? He was a bleeping shortstop! Oh, I understand, and that's the larger problem here at Place. He knows nothing. Yeah, he knows nothing, and he uh, wired himself $415,000 this month. Making five million a year, Stugatz. You just spent the entire segment. Is that why you were chewing on your tongue? Right here. Did you no, spend, I got a blister. Uh, uh, I see. No, but there it is. Look, it's on. Look, Mike. On my calculator. Mike, what? Put, hold up the calculator, Mike. What does it say on the calculator? It's what he was doing the entire segment. Sausage fingers on a calculator. Four hundred sixteen thousand. <laughs>